The Warrior, the most iconic class in video gaming, and the most populous class at the start of World of Warcraft Classic. No better place in my opinion to start my class guide series on the Burning Crusade, so let's dive into it. Just so that we are clear on what is being discussed in these guides, we will be discussing, discussing talents, rotations and abilities, stat priorities, the journey to 70, and in regards to each of these if there is anything particular that jumps out about that class that is does not fit within these categories, we'll discuss that as well. We won't be discussing, however, racial abilities, PvP, or professions. Now, this is simply because I am writing these guides as a guide to people who are coming from Classic, who are going to already be playing a level 60, going to 70, and therefore have their race set in stone and their professions probably already pre-leveled and as a result I don't want to be trying to convince you to restart the game anew based off of anything that I say. PvP on the other hand I am simply not discussing because it's an entirely different subject and one that I do not know anything about so I wouldn't want to be trying to act as though I did to give you guys information on something in which I am fairly clueless at least in terms of the TBC PvP scene. So the first talent tree that we're going to take a look at is going to be the most popular and that is the Fury PvE talent build. Now, what we have on screen here is my belief for the best talent build that you can set up for at level 70 going into endgame content. So we will take a quick look at each of the talents. A lot of them are going to be the same as in Classic and we will skim over those but we will take a little bit longer to look at the new ones. So. First up, we have Cruelty, which is going to be exactly the same as you find in Classic. We've also taken Improved Demoralizing Shout. It is a good point to mention here that there is some flexibility in this class guide. For example, if you don't want Improved Demoralizing Shout and you prefer Booming Voice for leveling or even for PvE endgame content, then by all means take it. But this is the spec I have chosen for the guide that we are doing later in this video in terms of how we're going to get to level 70. Next up we have commanding presence which is going to increase the attack power bonus and health bonus of your shouts, very handy talent. We're going to have enrage, we're going to have dual wield specialization, we're going to have sweeping strikes which has been moved over into the fury tree from the arms tree in TBC which is going to radically improve things like your dungeon cleave when leveling to level 70 and a talent I highly recommend picking up. We're also going to have weapon mastery which is going to reduce the chance of your attacks being dodged. This is another new talent and something that is absolutely fantastic and I highly re recommend picking up. Especially if you are going to be doing any dungeons or any content on your way to leveling up that is going to involve killing mobs that are a higher level than you. The reduced chance to be dodged is going to be exponentially great in terms of your DPS because of course the less you're dodged, obviously as well as being more damage on the target, there's also more chance to proc crits and get some of these other bonuses which leads us nicely onto Flurry. Flurry is going to be our next talent of choice. Bloodthirst, we're also going to pick up Precision which is going to increase our hit chance by 3% which is going to be incredibly important when we discuss our stat priorities later on. We're going to have one point in Improved Whirlwind this is a great talent, however in the build we simply don't have another available point to put in it for a second rank as there are other things that simply take up more priority than it. Now we're on to the new stuff, we're going to have our improved berserker stance, increasing our attack power and reducing our threat while in berserker stance. This is a fantastic talent and it does basically mean that you're going to be sat in berserker stance pretty much all of the time, or at least you can play like that should you so desire. And then we have our new talent, which is going to be Rampage. Now, Rampage is going to be your new main focus button in your rotation as a DPS warrior. It reads that a warrior goes on a Rampage, increasing their attack power by 30 and causing most successful melee attacks to increase attack power by an additional 50. The effect will stack up to 5 times and last 30 seconds. This ability can only be used after scoring a critical hit. Now, that last segment is incredibly important and is something again that we will discuss when it comes to our stat priorities later. Next up we're going to take our additional points after we've reached Rampage and go over into the arms tree that we see over here. Now the first thing we're going to pick up here is going to be the improved heroic strike reducing the cost of our heroic strike. 
two additional points going to deflection simply because we don't use rend and deflection is the only other talent here so it's the only one that gives us any value whatsoever we're then going to put three points into improved thunderclap we're then going to put two points into iron will we'll come back and put the third point into it later but that's going to take us on to the next row we're going to get anger management as top priority three points into deep wounds then we'll go back and put that extra point into iron will so that we can unlock impale which is going to increase our critical strike damage bonus for our abilities no matter what stance we are in now as you may have noticed in that talent build there is a lot of focus on critical strikes and that is going to feature in our stats priority section in a little bit but that is our basic overview of our talents recommendation for fury now there is some play in it like i said so if you do want booming voice that's a choice a lot of people choose to make uh, piercing howl is very popular if you are leveling and or if you are doing any pvp blood craze is also a popular choice not personally one that i'm too big on for leveling um most notably because i don't take many hits when i'm leveling due to how i elect to do my leveling improved execute again is also a valid option the only problem is for all of these talents as great as they are you do have to sacrifice points elsewhere if that is what you are going to want to choose if you're looking at the other talents in the arms tree, I really don't recommend any apart from possibly improved charge. Although, again, that's going to very much be dependent on how you're choosing to level. This is the build I recommend for PvE Fury if you are going to be leveling in a manner that is as I recommend later in this guide. Whew. So now we're going to move on to PvE arms. Now, first thing first, I do not believe that PvE arms is the way to go. If you do like that two-handed slow style of play, then by all means go for arms. But it isn't going to be competitive with Fury, at least not in my opinion. It is also very dubious as to whether this even really constitutes arms, given that we only go one tier lower than we do in Fury. But if that's your play style, by all means go for it. And this is the talents that I would recommend for it. We're going to start off with our improved heroic strike and two points into deflection. Basically all of them we just discussed in the fury tree down to here. Exactly the same. Now this is where it goes a bit different. We add in our two handed weapon specialization for a straight up damage increase. We take death wish as our big cooldown that we're going to have. That is going to increase our damage and make us immune to certain CC effects. Now, here's our first point of variance. I've put my points into Sword Specialization, which I do believe to be the very best. However, if you have access to Maces or Pole Axes, or Pole Arms or Axes, then by all means take the talents there instead. But given that Swords are better, this talent is better, and they are also more readily available, I've gone for Sword Spec here. We've got for two points into Improved Disciplines, which is a cooldown reduction ability. And then finally, we've gone down into our Blood Frenzy and more importantly, Mortal Strike, which of course is what ARMS is all about. From there, we've gone over into the Fury Tree and picked up most of the same primary talents that we had from our Fury build. This time, however, we have taken Improved Slam as Slam is a feature that you can use in the ARMS Tree, whereas it is not viable in Fury. And our final talent build that we're going to take a look at is going to be going deep prot. Now, in our deep prot talent tree, there have been a wild amount of changes. So before we go into the actual prot tree, we'll look at where your spillover points go, which are basically going into the same things as before with deflection, improved thunderclap, cruelty, and demoralizing shout. You'll pick those up when you've finished all of the talents in the protection tree. So the protection tree itself, anticipation. The same talent that we have in Classic, however it's been buffed up dramatically so it's now 20 defense points that you get for this talent which is absolutely fantastic. Next row we're going to have both Shield Specialization and Toughness in full. We're then going into Last Stand, Improved Shield Block, Defiance, Improved Taunt, Improved Sunder Armor, 1 point with the Improved Shield Wall, Concussion Blow, Three points with Shield Mastery, three points with Focus Rage, 
Shield Slam, Improved Defensive Stance, Vitality, and Devastate, your new big ability. Now, there is a lot of play in this talent tree. So some of the most notable talents that people like to pick up and drop from this particular build that I've put on screen for you here, which is somewhat end gamey, I admit. So if you do find yourself not enjoying certain aspects of this talent tree, it is variable. You can take points out of Sunder Armor. You can take the point out of Improved Shield Wall. And you can take the points out of Improved Taunt based on your needs. These points can then go into one-handed weapon specialization, or of course, if you say taking a point out of improved taunt, it can go into the improved shield wall if you find that more helpful. You can pick up the improved revenge talent. It's very good for dungeon runs. So if you are leveling or you are finding yourself doing a lot of five mans to get badges, this is a pretty fantastic talent. However, in raids, it's pretty much wasted. So do bear that in mind. Personally, I would say that this is the talent setup to run when you are just beginning your raids. However, if you are preferring, then you could drop the three points in Sunder Armor for the three points in Improved Revenge while leveling if you're not finding yourself having any problems with regards to your threat generation. Improved Sunder Armor is going to be better for threat generation, whereas Improved Revenge is going to be much better for CCing the mobs and potentially helping with mitigation. The big notable talent here is Devastate, which is going to essentially be an attack that also triggers the Sunder Armor effect. Now that is your new talent and is going to be what you're going to want to beeline for, so when you are progressing your talents, you do want to always be making your way down where possible to get yourself to here before picking up additional points higher up where you will be aiming for later. That being said, you do have enough points spent in other trees that if you are at level 60 going into TBC, then you will be able to go straight down to Devastate, much the same as you could with Rampage in our Fury build. So, the next thing we're going to talk about is going to be the rotations for the specs that we have discussed for the Warrior. Now, just before we dive into that, I do want to apologise for the fact that the background footage, yes, you do see it from retail, and I am on a Demon Hunter. There is a reason for this, and it will become more apparent later in the video, but as you can see, it is running TPC content, and we just simply needed something to put in the background while we discuss the more important information that we're going to have on the right-hand side of the screen here. So, starting with Fury, we are going to work more with a priority system as opposed to a typical rotation, um, but it is going to be quite simple and easy to use. So, how it basically works is that your top priority is to maintain your Rampage buff, at all times. Now this is the buff that you get from using the new ability Rampage, the bottom talent in the Fury tree. And the buff, if I'm not mistaken, I think it lasts 30 seconds. And as a result, this is something that you can potentially have up 100% of the time and is your top priority. Next priority is to keep your Bloodthirst on cooldown. After that, you are keeping your Whirlwind on cooldown. And if you have your Rampage buff, and the other two aforementioned abilities on cooldown, you will want to use your Heroic Strike as a Rage Dump if you are over 60 Rage. Otherwise, you will want to maintain your Rage so that you can keep up with the higher priority issues further up that list. Now, this all changes very much when the target drops below 20% on their health bar, at which point you will want to execute whenever possible. Your execute becomes your top priority, and what you will need to be doing at all times when available. Now next up we have arms. Now this is something that I did mention is not necessarily the optimal spec to play and as a result it's not something that I was particularly familiar with and as a result I did need to look this up for myself to pass the information on to you. But the best information I was able to find is that there is a consensus that it works sort of more like mini rotations as a rotation. Now this is going to be that your first interaction with the mob is going to be rotation one. Then once that's completed, you move on to part two, part three, part four. And then once you've completed part four, you go back to the beginning again. So in this description on the right, A is your auto attack. So you're going to want to start your white swings, get an auto attack in, then move into slam, then mortal strike. The next is exactly the same, but you replace mortal strike with whirlwind. 
then the third mini rotation is the same as the first and then on your fourth where you would have had mortal strike or whirlwind you want to replace with any instant cast ability so this is things like maintaining your buffs for example with your shouts or anything else of that nature that you'll find that you need to do in the natural occurrence of a fight now the only exception to this rotation rule is that any slam can be replaced with heroic strike if your rage goes above 60. so quite a simple rotation for arms but this is the best that you're going to be able to manage although like i have said previously you are going to be outshone in pve by fury so do bear that in mind so next up we have the protection talent tree and this is going to be something different compared to the rest of our rotations obviously being a tank it's more a case of you need to keep yourself alive and generate threat as opposed to deal damage and as a result it's a much more difficult task to actually give you a string of abilities and the order you should use them in so how i've written this here is that your top priority is to maintain both your demoralizing shout and thunderclap debuffs on all enemies these are going to drastically reduce the amount of damage that is coming in on you and as a result give you considerably more survivability second thing that i've listed here is your spell priority for threat now this is going to be shield slam revenge and devastate now those are the order of spells in terms of highest threat to lowest threat that you're going to be want to be using to maintain the target aggro on yourself but it is also worth mentioning as i've written here that other utility spells are going to be needed as a tank and you should be deciding for yourself as and when you use these you do have a wide arsenal of abilities as a protection warrior and i'm afraid that it is something that you are simply just going to have to get the hang of for yourself as it is something that varies wildly from each fight to the next thankfully after our inherent variability in our tank rotation as it were we have something much simpler to talk about now and that is going to be stat priorities so we'll work our way across the same order that we did with our rotations and we'll start with fury so as a fury warrior your top priority is going to hit be to hit the soft cap for expertise which is 7.5 percent and nine percent hit chance now this is where it is worth mentioning that these values that i've given here do not account for talents as in, you can inherently pick different talents to what i suggested if however you did pick the talents that i suggested for fury you will only be looking at 5.5 percent that you need to hit for your expertise cap and only six percent hit this is because of two talents in the fury tree that provide the ability to be dodged less in weapon mastery and increase your hit chance with precision after that your second highest priority is going to be critical strike this is going to be because you have so many different abilities and effects that proc from getting critical strikes third up we're going to have attack power which is going to come from your primary stat strength as well as any gear that simply has attack power on it in fourth you're going to have armor penetration this is a point of contention because it is an excellent stat do not misunderstand that armor penetration is very much on par with attack power and arguably critical strike but they have to come in an order and it is ever so slightly weaker but arm penetration appearing on your gear is certainly not going to be a bad thing and finally we're going to have haste again not a bad stat to have but you are going to get it from other sources in large amounts if you have more of the previous stats that have been listed next up to skim over it arms again if you are deciding that that is the way you want to go you are looking at exactly the same stat priority as fury the only real difference here being that you are less likely to have the talents to reduce the amount of expertise and hit that you are going to be able to get there are some talent builds for arms where you might be able to pick up the expertise from the talents but not really the hit and as a result you are going to have to prioritize them slightly higher in your gear other than that you are looking at the exact same stat progression as fury now once again things get a little bit more complicated when you start to look in the protection tree now it starts off really simple when you get to max level and you are looking to enter raiding you are going to be needing to get your defense value for crit immunity up to 490 now 490 again this crit number is a combination both of your base stat what you're getting from gear and also the talents that you have selected now anticipation on the top row 
of the protection tree gives four skill per point in it. So if you have all five points in it, that's 20 lower that you'll have to achieve. So you will only have to get to 470 defense. So do bear that in mind. Your next priority after that is going to be getting to the soft cap for hit rating. Again, that's going to be 9%. And you are going to be doing this to increase your threat generation. Also, do bear in mind that the 490 for crit immunity and 9% for hit cap are values that are for raiding. If you are looking simply to do 5 man dungeons, these numbers will be lower. So do not over cap defense or hit for lower level targets. But once you have achieved the values that you're looking for, things do get a little bit more complicated because there are a lot of stats that are going to intertwine with each other in various different ways based on how much of them you have. So you are going to be looking at a mixture of stamina, dodge, parry and all offensive stats in order to suit the playstyle and the content that you are going to be doing. For example, once you are well geared, chances are you're going to be able to wear a bit more offensive gear to do five man dungeons that you've simply surpassed the difficulty curve as it were for. And as a result, then you're going to be wanting maybe two sets of kit one that's offensive for doing the easy content that you're going to be looking to do and or a defensive set for going into more challenging content. Of course, you can always pick just one of these sets and play to your playstyle because there are plenty of tanks that like to be overly aggressive and kill the mobs before their defensive frailty shine through. Or again, the opposite, you want to be more traditional, go incredibly survivable and then have to work to maintain threat. It is entirely up to you. Now, finally, the last thing I want to mention is the route to 70. Now, straight off the bat, what I want to get out of the way is that this is going to be what I recommend as the route that you take to go from level 60 to level 70. It is not the only option, but it is the one that I believe to be the best. If it doesn't work for you, if it's not the way that you want to play, by all means, get to level 70 however you please but I'm going to be recommending doing dungeon farming. Now, dungeon farming has some big advantages for leveling as you will be used to in classic. However, in TBC, these are considerably more pronounced. So first things first, by doing this, you are of course going to be cutting out the difficulty of progression of gear as you are going to be getting considerably more gear considerably easier by running dungeons than you would do via questing. Secondly, if you are going to be leveling in the early days of TBC Classics release, chances are that the questing experience is going to be somewhat mobbed and you are going to have a hard time finding anything that you are actually able to kill to get your quests completed. Third off the bat, you are going to be looking at the fact that you are going to be getting reputation while you are leveling. Now this is absolutely huge in TBC as there are quite a lot of values to getting the reputations completed for all of the major factions. Now, you will get reputation by questing if that is the way that you elected to go. However, the questing experience that you, sorry, the questing reputation that you get is of course limited to the amount of quests that there are. Once you've completed all of those quests, that is how much rep you are going to be getting from them. If, however, you ran dungeons, you can continue to run those dungeons and get reputation all the way up to the honored value for most dungeons and some dungeons all the way up to exalted, meaning that you can potentially get yourself to exalted with a faction by the time you get to level 70 without completing a single quest. This isn't likely and it's more likely that you're going to get yourself partway there, but that is going to be incredibly valuable not only for pre-raid best in slot, which a lot of classes get a lot of pieces from the various different factions, but also for the sake of attunement. Now, attunement in TBC is actually one of the biggest parts of the end game. I'm going to throw a little chart up on for you now. And for any raider or would-be raider, this is going to be something that you're going to either already be familiar with or need to get familiar with in order to be able to access the raids. Now, this is even more daunting than it looks, but what I'm going to show you now is how it can look in terms of what you can get completed by doing the reputations in these dungeons. So all of the red filled circles are actually the reputation requirements that you can get at least part way to by doing dungeons to level. Chances are you won't get all the way to revered, although it should be noted that you may not need to, 
as in Classic TBC, we don't know what version of TBC we're getting, and if, like Classic, we get the latest version, you'll actually only need to get Honoured. So needless to say, that is going to be a very large part out of the way of that progression that you would otherwise need to do at level 70. Finally, what I would like to say is that if you leave your quests to level 70, rather than using them to level, you will get additional gold for the completion of these quests due to the max level conversion of experience into additional monetary value. Now this is absolutely massive as the value of the gold in that early stage of TBC's endgame is going to be huge and you can get the good chunk of let's say the amount that you're going to need to be able to learn flying simply by doing these quests at level 70 instead of earlier. Now, of course, if you wanted, you could just do the dungeons at level 70 in a more conventional manner, but it just proves to be considerably less efficient, especially if, for example, you were looking to run dungeons to get that reputation, whereby if you've already completed the quests and got to Honoured, a lot of the dungeons simply aren't going to give you value anymore, whereas if you did it the other way around, you would get value for both your quests and your dungeons. Now, as a result of everything that I've just told you, it may actually become quite apparent that one thing that you're not really going to be focusing on when leveling through these dungeons is actually going to be the gear that you're getting. So while it is going to be nice, you're going to end up running so many dungeons in this leveling progression of the same dungeon repeatedly. And I appreciate that that can be tedious, but you will be receiving basically every drop in principle because of simply how the law of large numbers work. If you run these dungeons sufficient number of times, you're going to see everything. And chances are you're going to be running these dungeons a sufficient number of times. This is because we're not primarily going to be focused on necessarily the best drops for you or even the best experience per hour. You may end up doing dungeons that are ever so slightly out of the optimal bracket for your leveling progression and only be having green mobs, for example. This is because what we are going to be primarily focusing on is the reputations that you can be grinding in these dungeons. Now, I am going to pop up on screen for you now a progression of what you can expect per dungeon for your reputation with each given faction. The level brackets of each dungeon that will give you the reputation with each of those factions as well as what faction it is that you will get the reputation for in any given dungeon. Now a few things to bear in mind is that these level brackets and estimated rep per run is estimated. So the level bracket does somewhat vary, but not really that much. Whereas the reputation per run, this is what I was able to achieve in retail, but without any reputation boosts by killing every single mob. So do bear in mind that if you have a reputation boost, be it from being a human or the Dark Moon Fair or anything like that, then it will be slightly different values that you are able to achieve. Also note that the underbog reputation listed here is simply the Scenarian Expedition reputation. You do get considerably more Sporagar reputation, but that isn't as important of a reputation to get and is also one that you will get more of, so therefore by extension you will get there quicker. So if you are grinding out your Scenarian Expedition reputation with this dungeon run, you'll get there with Sporagar regardless, or at least to where you can get to. All of the dungeons I listed on that chart are the leveling dungeons that you are able to get up to honoured with their given faction in and is something that I would highly recommend trying to do by the time you get to the 67-68 mark as that is when you'll be able to enter the higher level normal dungeons where you can potentially get all the way to exalted. You are also going to require either honoured or revered, we're not quite sure yet based off of which version of TBC we get to get the keys to enter heroics. So if you are already able to have those keys when you hit max level, it's going to make you considerably more desirable to enter into a party for the heroic dungeons. With all of that being said as well, you are also going to be able to attain the reputation items that are going to be in some cases your pre-raid best in slot before raiding. Now, Again, there is some variance here on what we're going to get when it comes to TBC, as we do not know if we're going to be able to get the Honoured Blue PvP gear, which is going to be better for PvE than a lot of other items might be if we are able to get that at the start of the expansion. This is unclear. If it is the case, then you will definitely want to be getting to Honoured with basically everybody so you can get this gear. 
However, if not, I am going to list a few of the warrior specific reputation pieces here now that you might want to look out for and prioritize the reputations for. So first up, we have our honor hold reputation rewards. Now, these are two in quantity and they are the honors call, which is going to be a fantastic beginning starting tank weapon in that it does provide both dodge for survivability and critical strike for generating additional threat but even more notably is going to be the veteran's musket now this weapon is going to provide stamina agility and most importantly hit so when you are in the early days of progression and trying to get yourself to that soft hit cap this is going to help get you part way there next up with the scenarian expedition we have the strength of the untamed now this is going to be a fantastic starter necklace for tanks once again providing that dodge chance which is going to prove invaluable for protection warriors also worth noting for the protection warriors while farming your scenario expedition reputation if you do find yourself gathering what you require for sporagar as well which is highly likely if you farm your scenario expedition in the underbog you can get yourself a shield the petrified lycan guard now this is going to be at level 62 this becomes available to you so it's something you can get nice and early if you grind out the reputation nice and fast and it'll probably see you through to level 70. Next up we have our consortium reputation so consortium is going to get us access to an alternative of our gun that we saw earlier if you are at a stage of gearing where you don't require the hit this is going to provide you a critical strike alternative in the consortium blaster and in addition to this it's also going to provide you a lovely necklace for beginning progression in that it is the haramad's bargain which is simply going to provide both strength and agility as base stats next up we have a couple of buttes for the tanks out there the time warden's leggings which are going to provide a massive amount of stamina and dodge as well as providing three sockets that can also provide dodge chance as well when filled we are also going to be seeing the Rift Maker, which is a relatively fast dagger, which will be good for threat, with a chance on hit effect to increase the time of an opponent's attacks by 10%. And last but not least, with Lower City at Exalted, you will be getting yourself a rather nice ring for helping you to achieve the Expertise Cap. This is the Shapeshifter's Signet, which is going to come with a chunk of agility, which is going to provide that critical strike chance that you need as well as expertise to get you to that soft cap. Now, with all of these things listed for you, you are going to be able to work out for yourself where your priorities lie in terms of the progression of your reputations. You are going to want to get to at least honored or revered, depending on the variant of TBC Classic we get, to get that key anyway, as well as progress with your attunements. It will also be worthwhile to realize that you may want to prioritize the reputation that gets you the key for the heroics that drop the best pieces of gear for you. However, when you hit level 70, I would honestly recommend just running every heroic you can get your hands on, so don't worry too much about that one. The last point worth mentioning is that once you hit the higher end of the 60s, so 67, 68, 69, and you want to finish off your progression into 70, new dungeons do become available to you that are essentially a high level dungeon in each of the questing hub areas. And these will be available to you to finish off the reputations all the way to Exalted, be it the Shattered Halls for the Honor Hold or Thralmar reputation, the Steam Vault for your Scenario and Expedition reputation, or the Shadow Labs for your Lower City reputation. Given that these additional dungeons open up to you, as well as the Tempest Keep dungeons when you achieve a higher level, it is another reason that you will want to progress through dungeons to get these initial grinds out of the way so that you aren't running over doing these dungeons at later levels when you could be doing the higher level dungeons. Now for the closing thoughts slash class specific segment of the leveling process and guide that we are doing today, obviously when it comes to warriors. Now the warrior doesn't have that much to talk about specifically in terms of its progression up to level 70 or anything specifically it needs to be noted in the guide. There is obviously going to be classes where there are like class specific quests and things of nat that nature to discuss but for warriors it's not going to be that much break from the default progression of things the only thing that is worth noting is that if you do intend on doing dungeon cleaving 
but you do want to be a DPS, it may be worthwhile just for the leveling progression to spec protection and go back DPS at level 70 if you are wanting to make it easier to get groups. It is obviously going to be preferable to use the same group to progress the whole way up in a single stint ideally, but realistically still you are going to want to stick to the same five people, at which point if you set your group in advance you probably are going to be able to get yourself a DPS slot. If you do want to find it easier to pug however, do consider going tank. It is going to make your life considerably easier to get groups. But that is going to about do it for this warrior guide. I do hope you enjoyed or found it useful. If you are looking for the other classes, they are on their way with their guides. So do please consider subscribing to the channel. And I hope you enjoyed. It is going to be a longer video and I do apologize for that, but there is a lot to cover. I will try and get the future videos in this progression series down a little bit, but I think we have been fairly in depth, so I'm not too minding about the length of the video. If it does bother you, let me know down in the comments below, but for now guys, I hope to see you in the next one. Laters.